For those of you who are with us this morning uh, for a really fascinating conversation among uh, uh, experts who have uh, used the Bath archives here at Stanford to do a lot of innovative research uh, on Iraq, in addition to those who have done field work in Iraq, on both Iraqi history and contemporary Iraqi politics and how it relates to the Iraqi state. Welcome back to all of you. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, um, I'm Colin Call. I'm the social science co-director here at CSAC, the Center for International Security and Cooperation. I also head something called uh, the Stanford Middle East Initiative, um, which uh, tries to connect various threads of activities going on among faculty and students on Middle East issues here at Stanford, but also to try to organize specific conversations like the one we're about to have now about the changing dynamics inside the Middle East and how it's affecting international relations and international security uh, more broadly. So uh, it's in that spirit that, that uh, we collaborated with uh, uh, Professor Mark Lynch uh, from uh, GW uh, in, in Washington um, and uh, David Patel, a former a CSAC alum who was who's now at the Crown Center at, at Brandeis, uh, to do this conference. And like I said, we've already had a panel on kind of uh, Iraqi history. We've had a panel on contemporary Iraqi politics. And today's discussion, of which I will uh, be a part, um, is really kind of looking, uh, both looking backwards and forwards as it relates to the intersection between Iraq and uh, American foreign policy, um, especially since 9-11, uh, and where things might be going uh, from here. And obviously, with a lot of events going on on the counter-ISIS front with Syria and everything else, it's a very timely time to talk about U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, I think. Um, uh, but uh, I, with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa uh, Blades, a professor in the political science department here, who has kindly um, offered uh, to moderate the conversation between Brett McGurk and myself. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk amongst the three of us for a while, and then we'll open it up to you. But Lisa, I'll hand yeah, it to you. Yeah, so thank you guys all for coming out today. Um, I want to begin by asking um, Brett and Colin, who are uh, known to many of us here in Encina Hall, to just say a little bit about their engagement with the Iraqi question during their time in U.S. government so we can get an understanding for their perspective and how they were engaging on this issue. So, Brett, I don't know if you want to start and tell us a little bit about sure. the nature of your it's kind engagement. Of a long, long story. Um, <laughs> uh, you guys all hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, real quick, in uh, 2001, I went to Washington as a law clerk for um, uh, on the Supreme Court, and I was there on 9/11. So the 9/11 attacks happened. After that, I was in private practice for a little bit, and when I got a call in 2003 in the fall, hey, uh, Iraq, they really need some people to help with their constitutional process. Would you be interested in going over for six months? So I said yes. I got there in January 2004. I spent a year there in Iraq um, in a very difficult environment. I saw the thing up close that this kind of we got into something that we didn't fully understand. We didn't have the resources for. Um, I then joined the Bush White House in the NSC in his second term in 2005 and was there for those four years um, in the further deterioration. And then we did the surge um, to align our ends, ways, and means, uh, which was a necessary policy at the time. Um, I then stayed on with Obama for a little bit. I left government a number of times, but got drawn back in, mainly um, on the Iraq question at various crisis points. Uh, 2010 government formation, 2011, the question of whether or not we keep our troops and how. Um, I then became Deputy Assistant Secretary for State on Iraq and Iran. Um, and I was in Iraq when ISIS uh, basically took over half the uh, country and, and Syria. Um, and then helped lead the ISIS campaign for the last two years of the Obama administration, and then for two years under President Trump. So I've spent a lot of my life uh, in this very difficult country, um, and I've seen a lot of the mistakes the U.S. have made and also a lot of the good things we've done. So I look forward to this discussion with you and Colin about uh, where we might go from here. And Colin, do you want to say something about your sure. Iraq engagement? Sure. So uh, I first came to Iraq uh, as an academic who studied civil and ethnic conflict in the developing world. And like, uh, like many academics after 9-11 who studied in that area, our gaze turned toward the greater Middle East and U.S. interventions uh, in the Middle East. And I used to joke that I, my original research was on the causes of state failure and my second research project was on the states we helped fail. Uh, and uh, Iraq uh, was, uh, was one of those. Um, my, my fifth year as an assistant professor then at the University of Minnesota in the political science department, I got one of these uh, fellowships through the Council on Foreign Relations called an International Affairs Fellowship. It's the same fellowship that people like Condi Rice got their start in government. And I think of it kind of as the embedded, an embedded nerd program, but it essentially takes uh, academics and puts them in a policy setting 
uh, for uh, a while to get some real world experience relevant to their research. I spent a year and a half at the Pentagon in the Rumsfeld era uh, in 2005, 2006. Uh, did a lessons learned study in Iraq. It was my first trip to Iraq in the summer of 2006, just as the Civil War was blooming uh, in, her, in, in a horrific way uh, in Iraq. Uh, I then left uh, the, US, uh, the US government, went back to Minnesota briefly, went to Georgetown, uh, at, uh, where I was a professor at the School of Foreign Service. And there's a long winding road between there and 2000. I was at the Pentagon for three years, and then I left uh, government for uh, two and a half years and then returned for the final two and a half years of the Obama administration at the White House, where I was the deputy assistant to the president and Joe Biden's national security advisor when he was vice president. And this was, uh, uh, I, I started there in the fall of 2014, just as the counter-ISIS campaign was kicking off, and people like Brett and General Allen and, and our military commanders and diplomats in the field were trying to forge this huge coalition to, to defeat uh, the Islamic State, and it was a major, uh, obvious priority for the Obama administration, but something that the vice president uh, and I spent an extraordinary amount of time on down the home stretch to include trying to manage some of the tensions between the Kurds and the Turks uh, in Syria that we're seeing um, blow up uh, at, the, at, at the moment. So in uh, any case, that's my intersection uh, with Iraq. So I think it might make sense for us to think about um, the case of Iraq in the context of a broader U.S. grand strategy after 9-11. So the first question is for both of you to really think about um, how does Iraq fit into that grand strategy? How does the U.S. inform its Iraq policy as a result of a post-9-11 world? I'm happy to start a little bit. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to write a book on this, on this uh, topic that kind of marries some of my academic interests and my uh, personal experiences. But Essentially, in the post-9-11 era, era, you've had three uh, uh, American presidents with fundamentally different worldviews, uh, and that they're, they've kind of road-tested their theories of the world uh, uh, in the world's most inhospitable terrain in the Middle East, with Iraq being uh, at the center of a lot of that. Uh, so starting with the Bush administration, uh, you know, after 9-11, the Bush administration identified the top national security priorities uh, uh, for the United States as what I would call the three Ts, the intersection of terrorists, tyrants, and technology. Uh, the the, the re possible relationship between rogue states and international terrorist actors and the possibility that uh, terrorists or rogue states could uh, develop and use weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Iraq was held up as a poster child for this threat. Uh, some would argue uh, the threat was uh, inflated. Um, my uh, research suggests that the, Bush that the Bush officials didn't knowingly inflate the threat, although the threat that they described was probably inflated. Uh, and we can have a conversation about that if you're interested in. But Iraq became kind of the focal point around which this threat was organized. Uh, and, but it was also seen, I think, as an opportunity, an opportunity to demonstrate uh, uh, unilateral American power uh, and uh, also an opportunity to plant the seed for democracy in the Middle East, which are two other pillars of Bush's uh, grand strategy, especially in the first term uh, of, the, of the Bush administration. So Iraq became kind of a test bed uh, for uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, view, uh, what, what I would call kind of uh, an onshore hegemony view of the Middle East, our ability to deploy massive resources uh, to transform a region that was seen as central to our national interests. In fact, of all the regions of the world, the greater Middle East was kind of seen as the center of gravity for uh, our national uh, interests. So I think that it does a lot to explain the invasion of Iraq. I also think the faith and how easy democracy could be planted in Iraq helps explain why so little planning was done to actually make it happen, because there was an assumption about how easily uh, a, a democracy would bloom once you removed uh, the regime. Uh, I also think, and, and Brett uh, was at the NSC during the surge, so he can speak more authoritatively about this, but I think one of the major reasons that at the end of the day, Bush decides to double down in the surge at great political cost was because it was the only option presented to him to salvage the project of Iraq. Uh, uh, you know, there's this infamous meeting or the famous meeting he had in the tank among with the Joint Chiefs, where Bush apparently, you know, yells at the at the at the chief of staff of the army and says, "Don't tell me how we're going to leave. Tell me how we're going to win." Right? And that 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 uh, the surge really comes about as the last best hope to salvage this uh, uh, this experiment uh, in Iraq. Fast forward to the Obama administration. Uh, Obama believed that that uh, that the war on terrorism uh, was an important national interest, but that it needed to be narrowly tailored. Uh, he also believed that the Middle East wasn't the center of gravity for American national interests, that the center of gravity was in the Asia Pacific, and that we had massively overinvested strategically in blood and treasure um, uh, and diplomacy and everything else in the Middle East to the expense of our ability to, to address other global challenges, the rise of China, um, uh, uh, 
um, the need to deploy forces elsewhere, the need to devote more uh, energy towards things like arms control and climate change and other things. And so the idea was to deleverage our position uh, in the Middle East uh, by following through on the drawdown that uh, the Bush administration had negotiated at the end uh, of, of 2008, again, that Brett had a front row uh, uh, ticket for. Um, I think that uh, Obama believed that as we, that, that he kind of had a, I don't know that he articulated this directly, but essentially had very much a free riding view of, of the Iraqis that the Iraqis would never step up either in the security domain or the political domain unless we kind of stepped back. Uh, and while willing to leave a small contingent of forces there beyond 2011, was not willing to do so in the absence of the Iraqis providing them pretty stringent legal protections. And so, uh, uh, you know, the United States essentially departs uh, after eight years of occupation and, and, uh, and involvement in Iraq at the end of the Obama administration. And I think that part of the, uh, the, the way in which Iraq intersected with this grand strategy is really a combination of the need to shift the focus elsewhere, but also uh, I, I believe that the best the United States could achieve in the Middle East was a degree of equilibrium that we weren't actually capable of massively tra transforming the region, that the best we could hope for is a region that was capable to some degree of managing itself, uh, and at the very least did not suck the United States into endless uh, ex ex expenditures of blood and treasure. Then ISIS emerges, of course. Uh, and I think what's interesting about Obama's response uh, to ISIS is how much it also reflected his worldview. He didn't immediately jump back in when Brett and others were calling him on the phone. Instead, he said, we're only going back in if we have a huge multilateral coalition, if we have an international mandate uh, for, uh, for doing it, uh, if, and if we can do it by, with, and through local partners so that we don't have to send hundreds of thousands of troops back into Iraq uh, or, uh, or Syria. And I think it's instructive in that, in that sense to compare the surge to the counter-ISIS campaign. At the height of the surge, there were 175,000 boots on the ground. We were spending 12 to $15 billion a month in Iraq. That's $275 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars, in two years of the surge. And we lost more than 1,000 U.S. service members killed and thousands more wounded just in the two years of the surge. During the counter-ISIS campaign, we deployed less than 15,000 troops at a total cost of $25 billion, about two months of the surge, and 17 U.S. dead. Uh, and that's because we worked through partners like the Iraqi counterterrorism services and in places like Syria, uh, the northern Syrian uh, Kurds. Uh, and that strategy is only viable if you have uh, a broad coalition, both internationally and inside of Iraq. Um, Trump doesn't believe that, uh, for, for Trump, the center of gravity is the homeland. Uh, it's not actually any particular region, although to, to the degree that he cares about any particular region, it is uh, the Middle East um, because of what he campaigned on as it relates to bombing the blank out of ISIS and, uh, and being harder line on Iran. Um, so like Bush in some ways, he had a pretty hawkish view of the region and also a tendency to align more closely with our traditional allies like Israel and, and Saudi Arabia. But like Obama, he didn't want to put a lot of military effort on the ground. And so if, if Bush kind of had an offshore hegemony approach to the region, and Barack Obama in, in, was inclined to move towards an offshore balancing view of the region, I would describe Trump's view of the region as offshore hegemony. That is, a diktat at a distance, a kind of aloof, mus a, 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 a kind of muscular but ultimately aloof projection of American power where we do things like we sanction the hell out of uh, Iran or now we're supposedly going to do it to Turkey, but otherwise don't put a lot of skin on the skin in the game. And essentially our strategy is to work through local partners by just telling them, go, go get them guys. Uh, and uh, with the main target being Iran. And that's the last point I will make because we'll, we'll get to this later, I suspect, is that I don't think that actually Donald Trump thinks about Iraq very much at all. And that to the degree that he does, now that ISIS's caliphate is largely uh, been uh, uh, destroyed for now. It's largely through the lens of how Iraq fits into a broader game with Iran. Uh, and that that's unfortunate because Iraq is important to US national security in many ways that have nothing to do with Iran. And viewing it simply through the lens of Iran uh, actually creates some negative implications for how we interact with the Iraqis. But I suspect we'll talk about that more. So Brett, you've been core to Iraq policy for 15 years. Continuity. Well, like I, I got there in 2004, so I had nothing to do with <laughs> <laughs> the, invasion, the army. Right. <laughs> that was already done. By the time I but you've seen a lot of um, change, a lot of continuity um, across administrations. How, you know, do you want to reflect on some of the things Colin said about the Bush administration? You were there. 
Um, yeah, let me just go, let me make a big picture. I just got back from, uh, I was in Abu Dhabi for a conference and just everybody's talking about what's US policy, what's the grand strategy. There's no, there's no grand strategy. Um, and if you just look at, in the Middle East, what US policy has done, I mean, I'll just start post 9 11. 2003, we invade Iraq with 130,000 American troops. Uh, in the Kuwait War in 1991, much more limited objective. We just want to get Iraq out of Kuwait. And we had 450,000 American troops, 28 countries, a total coalition of 650,000 troops. Uh, in Iraq, we had really three coalition partners and a total of about 150,000 troops. So, like, the ends, ways, and means of this uh, invasion, as I think if President Bush was sitting here, he would say the same thing, was a huge mistake. Um, we didn't really correct for that until 2007. We sent 30,000 American troops to Iraq. So we have 160,000 American troops in Iraq, a major war. As Colin said, often forgotten, we lost 1,000 Americans during the surge period to try to get Iraq into a somewhat stable environment. 2011, we withdraw from Iraq. At the same time, President Obama says Assad must go. So now we have a declared regime change policy in uh, Syria. That's our declared US policy. Um, in 2014, we start the counter ISIS campaign. And we did it very carefully, and I think in a very smart way, bringing the region in together with a strong coalition. Um, I actually think it was successful. But a year later, we do the JCPOA, which is a big, huge diplomatic initiative, obviously, with Iran. Um, and then two years later, Trump comes in. We get out of the JCPOA. And we max this maximalist policy on Iran is basically causing the Iranians to uh, provoke us in various ways. And I think that's going to continue. And I think we're actually we're closer to war with Iran than I think anybody appreciates. And now we see Trump completely abandoning in the most shambolic way, Syria. So US policy in the Middle East has just made a total hash of things. And nobody knows what to do about what the US is going to do. Um, and that's leaves the door open to Russia, China, are, who are seen and present themselves as much more liable actors. So in terms of grand strategy, if you look way ahead, I would just say we have to get back to a sense of balance, proportionality, being very careful in our objectives, our ends, ways, and means, um, not declaring grand objectives. So <coughs> whoever the next president is, I think that's going to be key. Um, on Iraq, look, Iraq has been central to our foreign policy going back um, particularly the 91 Gulf War. We were in a state of quasi-war with Iraq since from 91 through 9-11. Um, I agree with Colin, and I, when I joined the White House, I mean, I, I've seen a lot. So they did, but they did believe there was WMD. There's no question about that. And this nexus of state-sanctioned terrorism and WMD was a significant fear. So that was a driver. There was also the underlying, um, what's causing all this terrorism from the region? And part of the re reason was believe that you have all these dictatorships that are holding people under the a thumb of these authoritarian states and therefore people when they want to uh, unleash their aspirations they come at us so we, we become the, the boogeyman and the excuse so therefore let's open up the region let's have more democracy that led to Bush's famous uh, second inaugural that our US policy is to end tyranny in the world and you talk about an ends ways and means a problem <laughs> um, but that's kind of what came out of 9 there was a belief that 9-11 and the, and the cause of terrorism is the fact of these authoritarian states that are holding people uh, basically without any freedoms, without any outlets. So they look for outlets through uh, terrorism. It makes it ripe for extremism. And that was a, just a core belief. So um, in terms of grand strategy, I think we kind of hit on it where we are now. We just want to keep Iraq relatively stable, maintain a US military presence that is not too uh, burdensome with a lot of coalition partners. We're in Iraq now with 22 coalition partners. Um, I think we have a real opportunity, um, but I am concerned by uh, some of the more maximalist policies in the region, particularly the Iran policy is putting an awful lot of pressure on the Iraqis, which they may not be able to withstand. Um, and now this withdrawal from Syria is going to have significant impact on Iraq, um, not just in the immediate term in terms of refugees, but that border, that Iraq-Syria border, it's a big desert called the Jazeera Desert. It's the kind of heart of Al-Qaeda type movements and ISIS, what we know as ISIS. And it's just going to open back up again. And um, this is really a shame because we had this thing. It was relatively stable. It's complex. you got to manage it. But it was relatively stable. And now it is just a whole tapestry has just totally unwoven. And as we speak, we are <clears throat> evacuating our US military facilities in Syria. Um, and this is being done in such, such a rushed and shambolic and unplanned way that we are bombing our facilities as we leave, um, which is extraordinary. That is the any time you do this, there's always an evacuation plan. 
um, the break glass worst case scenario is what we're doing now. So that's how serious uh, this is. And the ramifications, I think, will be quite serious and will bleed into Iraq. So I know you don't actually have an answer to this question, but what is in Trump's head when he thinks about <laughs> Iraq? Like, what explains Trump's approach to the Iraqi question or the Iraq problem? So I've heard him a little bit on Iraq. All it is, uh, we spent a trillion dollars, what a disaster, what the hell are we doing mm -hmm. now? And that's it. that's it. And then you say, okay, well, here's the reasons why it's important. Um, well, why can't we get their oil? I swear, that's, he wants to know why we can't get their oil. That was something mm -hmm. that was very much in his head early on when I was involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was interesting when he, when I, at the end of last year, when I resigned after he announced a sudden get out of Syria in 30 days, which came out of nowhere, um, there was also a concern that he was going to say in the next breath, and by the way, what are you doing in Iraq? Mm -hmm. um, get out of there too. What ended up happening, I think the political backlash to his decision in December, uh, Mattis resigned, I resigned. Um, Mattis obviously much more high profile, but it became a big political thing. Trump on Christmas Eve flew into Iraq, I think mainly to respond to this idea that he was um, making a big mistake. Uh, in the dark of night, uh, he, he discusses it like it's some sort of uh, you know scary war movie. Um, but he flew into our base in Western Iraq, um, met our soldiers, didn't really meet any Iraqi officials. But I think since he's been there and seen it, he recognizes that, oh, we have Americans mm -hmm. here and like nobody's dying. Um, so I sense he understands the importance of staying there, but I don't know. The thing with Trump though, if one thing goes wrong or something is a problem, he'll come totally he's liable to completely pull the plug mm. and this is a risk i was working last summer in in iraq on um, iraq had an election um important to remember they've had how many six changes of government since 2004 five of which are through elections which is really amazing in this part of the world but they had an election last year um, it didn't go particularly well in terms of our perspective um Muqtada al sadr who's a nationalist like make iraq great again guy um We've obviously fought him over the years. He's very different now, but he won the election. Uh, the second the second party to win was a heavily dominated Iranian-backed party. Um, and then the kind of moderates that are very pro-West uh, did not do very well. So we were in Iraq trying to sort this out and to try to come out with a government that at least wanted us to stay and at least wanted to more or less continue engagement in the region, which had been going well, continue engagement between Baghdad and the Kurds, which was going pretty well at that time. So we wanted a government to come out of it that just basically protected our general interests. And I was there working that throughout the summer. Um, the main thing, and I was in touch with Pompeo and others throughout it, just keep this off the front pages so it's not a problem that gets on Trump's radar screen. Because if it is, um, he'll say, what the hell, what are we doing there? Um, and we did have some problems. We had some rock, a rocket landed like a kilometer away from our, um, our consulate in Basra. And the response was just to leave entirely, pull out of Basra. Um, but I think with Trump, so long as it's not a big problem mm -hmm. or no foreign leaders calling him saying, you got to get out of Iraq, which happened with Syria and Erdogan, you know, I think um, our presence is sustainable, uh, but we'll see. Um, there are other bigger structural problems in Iraq with the youth bulge or the protests mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. else that we're, we're less equipped to manage because we've withdrawn our embassy down to just a core, very tiny staff, um, mainly because of perceived threats from, uh, from Iran. So. So both of you guys have talked about the importance of Iran and the need to balance Iran. And this does seem to be um, a dominant prism through which we view U.S.-Iraq policy. Um, is this the right way to think about um, U.S.-Iraq policy? Or should we think, be thinking more broadly about how Iraq fits into the region beyond just the Iran-Iraq issue? So I, I think, uh, oh, I mean, I, I foreshadowed this in my, my opening monologue, but uh, <laughs> No, I think it's a disaster, actually, to view Iraq sol solely or primarily through the lens of our Iran policy, especially if one is pursuing the Iran policy that the current administration is, right? So uh, uh, Brett invoked this acronym, the JCPOA. You, those of you who don't know that acronym, it just stands for the Iran nuclear deal uh, that the Obama administration negotiated alongside the other permanent members of the UN Security Council and Germany and the EU uh, with Iran in 2015 that was then blessed by the UN Security uh, Council. 
uh, and uh, was meant to do one thing, which was to put long-term constraints on Iran's ability to weaponize its civilian nuclear infrastructure to turn it into nuclear weapons, uh, which is the, the prominent uh, concern that American policymakers and Israeli policymakers, frankly, had about, uh, uh, about Iran. Uh, Trump called it the worst deal ever. Uh, and uh, tried to withdraw uh, in 2017, but it was essentially blocked by H.R. Uh, McMaster and Jim Mattis and Rex Tillerson, the kind of adults in the room, as they were sometimes uh, described. Um, but by early uh, 2018, those folks were either out or marginalized and replaced with people like John Bolton and, and Secretary Pompeo, who had moved over from CIA. And uh, uh, Trump, uh, at the urging of his, of his advisors and his political folks who said, you campaigned on this, um, uh, uh, as well as, uh, you know, Bibi Netanyahu and others, uh, urged him to get out. So he left the, uh, the Iran agreement in May of 2018, and over the next six months began to reimpose crippling economic sanctions aimed at uh, uh, cutting off Iran's banking and energy sectors from, from uh, the global economy, leveraging uh, the importance of U.S. banking system and the role of the dollar to do that through what are known as secondary sanctions. We initially had some waivers that allowed countries like China and India and Turkey to buy some oil. Those waivers were stripped away in the, in the spring of 2019. And all of this was uh, in, 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 in support of what was called a maximum pressure campaign with the, no, with the, with the desire of essentially crippling uh, uh, Iran to the point that they would capitulate and thus agree to a much better deal uh, that is a deal that had longer constraints on their nuclear program, deeper constraints on their nuclear program, but also constraints on their ballistic missile, conventional ballistic missile program, their support for terrorism, their animosity towards Israel and Saudi Arabia and everything else. And so to the degree that there is a strategic principle that informs uh, the Trump administration's approach to the Middle East, it is this maximum pressure campaign on Iraq and it is, I mean, on Iran, and it is also the poster child example for what Brett was talking about of a mis mixed match between maximalist objectives and our ability to actually achieve them through the strategy that's being implemented. So Iran has not capitulated to a better deal. Uh, Iran has restarted the nuclear program that had been rolled back, and Iran has become more provocative uh, in uh, the Gulf uh, and uh, in, in, in Iraq uh, and vis-a-vis -vis U.S. forces in the region than they were before. So how does any of this play out with Iraq? Well, Iraq has close relations with Iran uh, because it's a neighbor of Iran. It has deep economic uh, interdependencies uh, with Iran. It has a lot of cultural connections with Iran. Millions of Iranians do pilgrimages to Najaf and Karbala and other places uh, every year. Uh, uh, there's an, you know, the, the Shia religion unites even as the Arab Persian uh, divides are, are real. Uh, and just to give one example, you know, a big way in which we're trying to put the squeeze on Iran is to cut off their ability to engage in, to, to sell energy to anybody, right? And in Iraq, uh, uh, I, th I think about a quarter of all their electricity comes from natural gas that they import from Iran, right? So the big thing that the, that the Trump administration has emphasized on Iraq is you can't buy natural gas from Iran, and you have to immediately disband all of these militias, these popular mobilization forces, the Hashtashabi, tens of thousands of which are closely aligned to Iran and its Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, and you have to do all of that now, and that you're, you basically have to choose between the United States and, uh, and Iran. Um, thankfully, uh, the final, final, final choice has not been put to the Iraqis, because if it is, they won't choose us, not this, at this moment, that Iraq has to balance the fact that they have a powerful neighbor that will be there forever, and that they have a patron in the United States of which they also want a relationship with, and our view uh, in the Obama administration is that it's better to see Iraq as a place to play the long game against Iranian interests, to lean into things that are real, like Iraqi nationalism, uh, uh, concerns about uh, uh, Iran's role inside Iraq, concerns about uh, some of the behavior of popular mobilization forces to include the possibility that some of those snipers that killed protesters in the last few weeks were Iranian-backed. Uh, forces to lean into those things, to integrate Iraq into the region so that countries like the UAE and Saudi Arabia can counterbalance Iranian influence and play the long game. Uh, uh, and also, by the way, and I'll end here, to maybe actually think of Iraq as a useful partner in trying to settle the region down. Already, Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi, who uh, Brett knows uh, personally uh, pretty well, has offered his good offices in trying to broker a de-escalation between the United States uh, and Iran or between Saudi and Iran. Iraq can play that role. So I think as long as we see Iraq as kind of a balance or a bridge, 
that's the right strategic way to, to view it. If we see it as a near-term zero-sum equation between us and Iran, that's a recipe for Iran winning in Iraq, us losing in Iraq, and the region being worse off. But Iraq is still serving as a balancing partner in that sense. I mean, do you also view the country through the lens of oil political economy, political stability, countering violent extremism, human rights. Um, are these relevant lenses as well, or is it all just part of a, of a U.S. grand strategy? So I, I'll put it this way. If Iraq didn't matter to U.S. strategic interests, it's hard to explain why every administration for a quarter century has fought a war against or inside Iraq. Like, it matters. It's a huge producer of, of oil. Uh, in fact, if, Iraq, if Iraq's oil production were not as high as it is now, it's hard to see how the sanctions against Iran could be effective without having devastating global economic consequences for the price of oil. I, I don't know, Brett, maybe you know, I think they're at four or five million barrels a day right now, uh, which is twice as much as, as Iran uh, produces. So the fact that they're a major uh, oil producer continues to be uh, important. The fact that if Iraq falls up, every time Iraq falls apart, it tends to have bad effects on the region and our interests. So we have an interest in, in Iraq not becoming a failed state. Um, and we do have an interest in countering Iranian influence in the region, but just not as a yes, no, zero, one, today or not a kind of uh, ultimatum, but in playing this kind of long game. And I think Iraq will continue to matter in all of those other ways. And last but not least, I do actually, while I, I don't think it was the right reason to go into Iraq to plant the seed of democracy and the democratization of Iraq has been full of all of the turmoil and turbulence that political scientists would have predicted and did predict uh, when this happened, now that Iraq is, is a more democratic country than it was before, I think we have an interest in trying to help that democracy succeed and showing that it's possible. Because I actually think that, in part, it was the chaos of democratization in Iraq that gave autocrats one argument when the Arab Spring happened to say that if this spreads any further, things are going to go bonkers. And of course, the Arab Spring provided all sorts of additional ammunition for that argument in places like Libya and Syria and elsewhere. But I do think we have a long-term interest in, in trying to help Iraq's democracy survive. On Iran, Iraq, I would just, there's a scene in, uh, in Robert McNamara's Fog of War in which, about Vietnam War, in which he goes to Vietnam in like 1994. He's sitting uh, at a dinner with his North Vietnamese counterpart, who we had never met. And his North Vietnamese counterpart, they were counterparts during the war says to McNamara, you know, I always want to ask you this question, like, why did you send millions of your young, your sons over here, lost 50,000 of them, to fight in a war in my country? I just never, I fully, I don't understand. And so McNamara says, so I explained to him in the context of the time, we were worried about the domino theory and Russia and China, the spread of, of communism. And um, so, you know, we didn't want that to happen here. And his North Vietnamese counterpart says, China, like we've been fighting China for a thousand years. And Russia was really here for all sorts of its own reasons, particularly when you came in and like, and McNamara concludes, uh, we didn't understand the first thing about Vietnam and what was really driving that conflict. Um, so in Iraq, there's so many differences between the Iraqi Shia and the Iranians. And this is an elementary point to anyone who studies this stuff, it is not an elementary point to a lot of people uh, who make U.S. policy, frankly. Um, Najaf and Sistani versus Qom and how they see Shia Islam, um, totally different. The Iraqis actually completely reject the notion of a supreme leader and Khamenei. And so if you play a very smart game, there is a tremendous opportunity to work with constituencies in Iraq, which undermine the very basis of the Iranian system and regime. Um, but we tend to see it uh, in a cartoonish way because Iran has tremendous influence in Iraq. Um, it's massive because of the vacuums that opened up, because of geography, because of culture, because of everything else, because of the collapse in 2014. Um, but I think that is a very, um, it's a very dangerous way uh, to look at the problem. And um, there is a serious issue in Iraq right now with elements of what we call the popular mobilization forces who are under the command of Iranian uh, commanders, and Qasem Soleimani and these guys. Um, Iraqi generals, Iraqi commanders, other elements of the PMF, I know them, they hate these guys. And at some point down the road, um, there's likely to be some sort of confrontation between those. But you wanna kind of bide your time before such a thing happens. Um, so I think if we were smarter about it, we have some opportunities. But when Trump flies into to Iraq and he says publicly, we're staying in Iraq to watch over Iran, 
Um, that's the kind of thing that makes everything worse. When we do this maximum pressure campaign, it's all a uh, means with no thought of the end. As Colin said, it is supposed to pressure Iran to encourage better behavior and Iran to come to the table. It is doing the absolute opposite and it is causing the Iranians to double down in Iraq in a major way as we are getting out of Iraq, we're drawing down our embassy to almost zero, we're getting out of our consulate in Basra, and now we are high-tailing it out of, <coughs> out of Syria. So I think the pressure from the Iranians on Iraq is going to dramatically increase. And if we come at the Iraqis and say, hey, you got to push back against this and do X, Y, Z, which they won't be able to do, um, it just increases the risk for us. Um, I've said this before, but I'm just, I'm very close to it, and I just got back from the region. Um, these images of America totally evacuating Syria strikes me, I looked through Abu Ghraib when that happened. And it was the type of event that when you're living through it, you think, my God, this is horrible, but you know, we'll get through this. No, you don't, you never get through something like that. Those images are so seared in people's minds. And um, Iran's national security strategy, the IRGC and Soleimani, they want to get America out of the region, which sounds delusional. You know, you get the Americans out of the region, or at least want to significantly diminish our influence in the region. But they're now sitting in Tehran, watching us evacuate all of our bases in Syria in the most embarrassing, shambolic, humiliating way. Um, they are seeing that no matter what they do in the Gulf, we are not going to respond, or we haven't responded. And our allies there, frankly, I don't think they really want us to respond, nobody wants a war. They are seeing us draw down in, um, in Iraq. So I think Iran, despite maximum pressure, they think they have the edge right now. It's like if you're playing basketball with someone, you just feel, I got the edge on this guy. They feel like they got the edge. And this dramatically increases the risk over the coming four to six months. A big debate in Abu Dhabi, tied us back into Iraq, but just 30 seconds, is, is there going to be a war? And one assumption is, Trump doesn't want a war. How many doesn't want a war? There won't be a war. Um, I think that is totally naive. Um, the Iranians will continue to meet our maximum pressure with their pressure. They're, I think they're going to start spinning advanced centrifuges again. They're probably going to do some more stuff in the Gulf. They're going to keep putting the onus on Trump to strike back. And if Trump strikes back, just knowing how the Iranians think, and I've actually spent a lot of time with these guys, they have already cocked their counterpunch. So if we strike, they will strike back. They are very careful not to hit anything close to Americans, because if they kill an American, they know um, we will definitely strike them in Iran. But in response to an American strike in Iran, if Trump had made that strike that he said he pulled back 10 minutes before we launched the bombs because it would kill 150 Iranians, once that happens, uh, they'll very much, I think, try to strike us in Iraq or somewhere else, and we can have a major Middle East conflict before you know it. So um, it is very risky. Iraq is right in the center of it. The Iraqis are extremely nervous about this. Um, it was good that the president of Iraq, Barham Saleh, who's like a, if any of you know him, he's a Western-minded, oriented, English-speaking guy, and I think it's good that he's the president who can actually talk to Trump. Um, but he's very nervous about this. He wants to use Iraq to actually decrease some of these tensions. But if something happens in the Gulf, and it could, and it's, I think we're actually pretty close to it, closer than people think, the pressure on Iraq will become enormous. And combined with the protests that we've been seeing, mm -hmm. um, massive protests from uh, the youth population, combined with an increase in Iran-American attention, which could actually result in a shooting conflict, the risk of kind of a revolutionary type current in Iraq taking hold that crosses into the international zone, that threatens our embassy, um, I would not put that now in the realm of possible. And I think our policies are actually making this um, worse. So I hope people are thinking about that, but it is, um, it's pretty risky. So given everything that you learned post-2003, going through the surge, fighting ISIS, if you were to design your own Iraq policy right now, what would it be? We gotta be patient and careful. This is the Middle East, this is the Middle East. We should not be playing with matches. We need to be patient and careful and realistic and prudent. Don't announce grand policies. I don't think it's smart for the National Security Advisor, no longer National Security Advisor, to say in the Roosevelt Room, how many, you only have one year left, you know, you're going to be gone in 12 months, as John Bolton did some months ago. Really? If you're speaking from the White House and putting the authority of the United States of America and make that declaration to the world, I think that is extremely foolish. Um, 
I think, again, our maximum pressure policy is creating all sorts of externalities that all sorts of unintended consequences. So I would really just try to pull back. We are not um, going to change the face of the Middle East, get or change the Iranian government, get Assad out of power. It's not realistic. Let me tell you how the Chinese are approaching this. Um, I was in Beijing and had a conversation with their uh, Middle East team, for what it's worth. Um, they explain the Middle East policy as like a 50-year, 100-year policy. And they have declared comprehensive strategic partnerships, meaning their highest level of diplomatic engagement <clears throat> with Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Egypt. They're kind of anchored to these pillars. Um, and you think about that, and they're good friends with Israel. They're good friends with everybody right now. It's extraordinary. Uh, we couldn't possibly do that. We see things in very much zero-sum uh, games. So I think their policy is a little naive. They're going to have to actually get into some of these internecine problems at some point. Uh, they think they can skate above it. But I would have a much more um, slow-paced, prudent approach. We want to pressure Iran in all sorts of ways. We want to contain Iran in all sorts of ways and try to focus on their most destabilizing uh, behaviors. We want to support our friends and allies, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, others. Um, I would stay in Syria for a while because it was giving us time to work diplomacy. Um, so I would just lower the objectives. The objective in Iraq is a slow, steady improvement in the situation. Slow, steady economic integration with the region. Better ties with their neighbors. We brokered in the Obama administration, carried on to the Trump administration, we finally brokered an opening between Saudi Arabia and Iraq, which has been dormant really since uh, before the first Gulf War. That was very successful, doing that sort of stuff. Um, there's no kind of, it's all singles and not even doubles. It's just kind of slow, steady improvement. Consolidate the institutions of the state in Iraq, the army, the counterterrorism service forces, the state institutions, improve relations between Baghdad and Erbil. These are things that we can do. Um, but it takes patience and there's just no kind of right hook punch that's going to suddenly make everything better. Yeah, so what, what's the call Iraq policy? And I'm curious to know how you're viewing the Chinese policy in the Middle East as well. <laughs> well, I, I think as a former US policymaker, it frustrates me that the Russians and Chinese can get to be friends with everybody, but we have to always take sides. Mm -hmm. It's infuriating, right? I mean, literally you have the Russians aligning with Iran and Hezbollah and, bom and, and bombing Arabs, and yet they get to get, have good relations with the Gulf Arab states and with Israel, right? Uh, whereas, you know, Obama signs a diplomatic deal that's actually in Israel's interest, and it's like the greatest thing that's been, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, the greatest uh, threat to our, uh, to our allies ever. Um, look, I think that, we sh that while we shouldn't run Iraq policy through our Iran policy, we do need to think about how Iraq fits into a broader regional frame. Uh, and I do think that, I, that, and, uh, that U.S. policy towards Iraq is not sustainable in a region that's this volatile, that's this on fire, and that has this much potential for a U.S.-Iran uh, conflict. I mean, for example, when we've mentioned the popular mobilization forces, the Hashtag Shabi, a couple of times, I mean, one of the things that's to our credit is that a lot of the Iraqi elite are petrified that the PMF is going to get them in a war. Why? Uh, there were drone attacks from uh, southern Iraq into Saudi Arabia against Saudi pipelines. Not the big attack you saw before. That doesn't appear to have been from Iraqi territory. But there were attacks from uh, uh, Iranian proxies in Iraq against Saudi Arabia. Israel has started to bomb as far away as Iraq to hit uh, ballistic missile uh, uh, um, deployments uh, inside of Iraq. And the last thing that Iraq wants uh, as it does face these societal challenges of a youth bulge and economic challenges and governance challenges is to be sucked into the vortex of a broader Middle Eastern conflict. So the best thing we can do for Iraq is to calm the region down. I, I think if we had a different president who cared about diplomacy and had a different team around him that was disciplined enough to execute a plan and that had a process to actually uh, run it through, there might actually be a moment here. Um, I don't want to be too, I mean, I think it's a total calamity, but they're, they're, they're in crisis, there is often opportunity. And, and I'd be curious if, on Brett's thought, thoughts about this too, but as I look around the map, almost every actor that is, es that is escalating or involved in a conflict has some interest in de-escalation, all right? So the Turks want to push the Kurds off their border, but they don't want a war, an all-out war with Russia, right? And they don't want us to devastate their economy uh, either. Uh, so at some point, uh, they may be inclined towards a, a de-escalation on terms that satisfy their security interests that pro and uh, probably leave the Kurds 
uh, in a rump uh, position aligned with, with uh, Assad, but maybe there's something uh, there. Uh, the Iranians believe that they are winning to some degree in the region, but they are taking a big hit economically. Uh, you know, they were selling 2.5 million barrels a day uh, in oil. Now they're selling a few hundred thousand barrels a day. Uh, that's not a sustainable economic uh, picture for them. They're not going to capitulate to Trump and Pompeo's terms, but they might be willing to dial something, uh, to, to dial things back in exchange for uh, American uh, and international uh, concessions. The Saudis and the Emiratis have hit a wall in Yemen. Uh, they're making no progress. There's no military solution. It's the, wor it's the world's worst humanitarian uh, catastrophe, and much of the responsibility hangs around their necks. They're losing friends right and left in Washington, and they're facing the prospect that Trump, who they thought was their best guy, is essentially not a trustworthy ally and may not be president in 15 months, right? So the Emiratis are already backing out of Yemen and signaling that they want to de-escalate with Iran in the, in the Gulf uh, domain. I think there's been signs that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince and de facto leader, of Saudi Arabia may be edging in that direction as well. So why do I mention all of this? To say that, like, I think that there are actually, there may be a Venn diagram that is just enough narrowly cut of common interest that there's a diplomatic play here. They would probably, but it would require us doing things that are hard, like talking to the Iranians again and talking to the Russians and probably not completely destroying the, the alliance with Turkey. Uh, and doing some other things. And I don't know whether we can do all of that. Uh, but if we don't, then the relationship with Iraq is more likely to be collateral damage to what, what's going on in the rest of the region and the rest of US policy. If we do, then maybe we can salvage a long-term partnership with Iraq as, uh, as a collateral benefit towards a regional de-escalation. The last point I would make, I want to repeat the point I said before. I do think Iraq wants to serve as a bridge and a mediator as we move towards a de-escalation framework. They're one of a couple states that could play that role. Oman is another. Uh, they could play uh, that role. And I think that we need to take them up on that. Uh, you know, the, the Iran nuclear deal only became possible because the Sultan of Oman was willing to broker quiet bilateral secret talks between the Obama administration and Iran uh, in 2012 and 2013. Uh, and Iraq could play a similar role, but it would require the Trump administration to do a whole bunch of things that it's never done before. Um, and the last point I would, I would make on this is, you know, Trump likes to go to Twitter and say, the same people who you know, got us into all those wars in the Middle East want us to stay. And, I, and the answer to that is, the same people who got us into all those wars in the Middle East run your Iran policy. <laughs> right? So, so uh, you know, and it's not like Trump has withdrawn the United States from, from the Middle East. There are more American forces in the Middle East today than there were when he took office. And the reason for that is that tensions are escalating with Iran largely because of a crisis that Trump created. So, we would have to just, he would have to decide he cares and that he wants to change and that he had a team around him who could execute and a process to do it. Uh, and if all of those things happen, I also have a bridge in Brooklyn. I <laughs> so before we open um, up the conversation to the audience, I just want to pose one more question to Brett, which is um, with regard to, you know, what happens next with ISIS? If we think that there's a kind of latency within this Jazeera region, for the um, recreation of, uh, of, of some mobilization on the part of these groups. Is this what your expectation is or what should we be looking for? So the ISIS of 2014 was really fueled on the backs of um, just incredible 40,000 foreign, we call foreign fighters came into, pouring into Syria, um, nearly all of them through Turkey. That's a, long, that's a longer story. Um, and these were the suicide bombers and the like, cannon fodder for ISIS. So in Iraq, starting in the second half of 2013, we started to see 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 suicide bombers a month blowing up. If you go back to that time, kids' soccer games, mosques, markets, the kind of stuff that just rips any society, uh, tears it apart. And these were all foreign fighters pouring into Iraq and Syria from all around the world. Um, that has pretty much stopped. So through our global coalition, we have a pretty good handle on trying to make sure people can't travel. Um, and it's just much harder to get into Syria. So I don't think you're going to see that type of like crazy you know, 50 suicide bombers a month, which is really, that was, that's really what drove this uh, ISIS war machine back in those days. Um, they were like the guided missiles of ISIS, just to get an armored truck and go to the target. That's crazy. Um, 
However, with the prisoners getting out of northeastern Syria, this is a total disaster. Um, it is very easy for them to reconstitute networks in these deserts, um, reconstitute clandestine cells, start killing police chiefs, mayors, tribal leaders. Um, so that will start happening again. So it's very important for us on the security side with the Iraqis um, to really increase our intelligence cooperation, our surveillance over those areas and everything. Because in 2013, um, it just kind of metastasized and we were never able to really uh, get after it. But now we do have a presence in Iraq. We do have enough ability to watch this. Um, and we really need to help the Iraqis because I think the risk is pretty high. But again, a lot of our intelligence assets and everything else right now is being sucked onto the Iran threat because of the Iran threat that's increasing. Um, so we're not going to see a 2014-like resurgence, um, but an ISIS uh, comeback in which we start seeing again. We haven't seen them in a long time, knock on wood, but car bombs in Baghdad, the type of stuff that drives Shia militancy, and you start to see the sectarian conflict bubble up again. Because of what's happening in Syria, I think the risk is quite high. And that's why I want to see President Trump talking today that this was strategically brilliant and is crazy. Um, he can't take credit for defeating ISIS and then watching them all escape from prison. I, I just, it's unbelievable. So it's, it's bad. I would hope as we are evacuating our bases in Syria, we are working to thicken up our uh, relationship with the Iraqi security forces, particularly in that border region, um, because this <coughs> it could get pretty bad. Okay, so I wanna give an opportunity um, to those of you in the audience who wanna participate in the conversation. So, um, you know, let me know if you have a question for, for Brett or Colin. Yeah. I have a question for either. Uh, I think both of you said that Iraq could play the role of a mediator in the region, and you feel that they want to. But isn't that just as risky because they're a democracy where who's in charge ch changes quickly, and it, whoever happens to be in charge today may want to do that, and we may start it, and then it's another party, and they don't want to do it. There's some of that. I think... Um... <laughs> What's so risky right now is we have no channels open with Iran. So, no, we had a lot of them in the Obama administration. They just were all separate. So there's no way to communicate at all, um, which raises the risk of miscalculation and uh, raises the risk of conflict. Um, because the Iraqis do have good relationships with the Iranians and the elements of the Iranian system that we really don't like, um, there is at least a one degree of separation in which if I'm meeting with an Iraqi official, I know I can get a direct message to the right guy in the Iranian system. So there's th that way to play it. Um, I think it's highly unlikely the Trump administration would, would consider face-to-face -face talks through the Iraqis, um, just given the current overall environment. Um, but again, we should think creatively. We know the Iraqis are meeting with uh, the Iranians, so what are they saying? Uh, what kind of messages do we want passed? Um, and it shouldn't just be all, stop what you're doing or we're going to come get you. They should be, hey, let's try to work. These are, these are activities we're very concerned about. Uh, if, you keep trans if you keep transporting rockets and material through Iraqi soil, they're going to blow up in the dark at night. Um, but here are some things that we're also concerned about. We're concerned about Iraqi instability, the protests and everything else. Is there, we want to help kind of calm this situation down. Um, I was actually... I did a negotiation with the Iran with the Iranians um, on getting a number of American prisoners out of out of Iran, and I happened to be with them. And these are the kind of more hardline guys in their system. As Iraq had a major protest movement that was approaching um, our embassy and everything else, and I happened to be with them while that was going on. And the guy I'm talking to had the Iran file for um, Iranian intelligence. I mean, so talking to the right guy. So he was working on this problem as I was working on this problem. Um, and we didn't coordinate at all because I don't trust the guy at all. But I was very keen listening to him and figuring out what they were doing. Um, and they were working to calm down the Sadrist side of the protest movement. And we were working to have the government do some things to give some uh, concessions to try to calm down the protest movement. Um, and it actually worked. So we weren't working together, but I kind of had a sense of what they were doing. Um, and we were able to work on it to calm things down. Um, it's just, it would be good to have that coordination, no, sorry, that's the wrong word, uh, that channel of communication so that we can work through crises in a way that protect our own national interests and our people. Having no communication with them, uh, uh, I think it, it, 
increases our ability to manage these very complex problems. Can I just say one? So I, I don't want to overstate this, but I also don't think we should view Iraq as a zero-sum game because there are instances in which we in Iran have similar interests. Not to the point where we can coordinate, but to the point where our actions can both be pushing in the same direction. So the Iranians don't want to see Iraq become a failed state. It's right on their border. A lot of the collateral damage from that fall on Iran. They want Iraq to be a weak country that they can have disproportionate influence over, but they don't want it to be a failed state. And they don't want uh, ISIS to reemerge uh, inside of, uh, of Iraq. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, a lot, there's a lot of debate about whether the United States should have kept troops in Iraq beyond 2011 with or without the types of protections we were demanding and whether that would have stopped ISIS. And I, and I don't know. Uh, my guess is it probably wouldn't have. Um, but one factor is, I, I think the dynamic between us and Iran, uh, uh, Iranian-backed militants in Iraq would have been very different had we just continued the occupation by keeping five or 10,000 forces beyond 2011, when all our casualties were coming from Iranian-backed uh, Shia militia. Uh, and that would have likely continued because they, would have, they were trying to drive us out. When ISIS reemerged, suddenly the challenge we saw was, a ch was also the challenge that Iran saw. And there's a reason why there have been no Americans targeted uh, and killed by uh, groups like Asab al-Haq or Kateb Hezbollah or other uh, groups close to uh, Iran since the rise of ISIS. And that is largely because while we don't coordinate, our interests are, are not, uh, our, our interests can push in the same direction in some, some places. So I don't want to be too Pollyannish about the possibilities with that, but it, it is to recognize that, we, we, that not everything is, is, uh, is, is the opposite. The last point I would make is the most important thing, whether we work or not through the Iraqis to pass messages, would just be to have direct communications with Iran. Uh, uh, and I'll give you one example of, of why, that would, why that was important. So uh, in mid-January of 2016, you might remember that about a dozen U.S. sailors sailed into the wrong place in the middle of the Persian Gulf and got scooped up by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC Navy. Uh, they were kind of humiliated and paraded on TV. And like this could have been the start of another hostage crisis, right? Uh, those sailors were returned in 24 hours without a shot fired for two reasons. One, because the Iran nuclear deal was about to go into effect, as well as some of these other things that Brett was working on, and this could have queered everything, right? It could have, the fact that we had a common interest with Iran in seeing this thing go forward, all of that could have been jettisoned. But the more important reason was that John Kerry talked to Javad Zarif six times in 24 hours and, and was able to communicate exactly what we were expecting, exactly what the implications would be if these folks were, uh, were not returned. Uh, and so that direct line of, of diplomatic communication at that moment that could have become a crisis stopped a potential, uh, uh, you know, a, something like we saw uh, after the Iranian revolution. Raise your hand if you think that exact same thing happened tomorrow, it would end up like that. It wouldn't. And, it, and we, because we don't have the, we don't have the lines of communication uh, uh, to make it happen. And I will say one last thing about Donald Trump. Um, he does not want a war until the Middle East, in, in the Middle East until the moment at which it so makes him look weak not to choose that option that it becomes politically perilous. And that moment happens when Americans die at Iranian hands. The moment that that happens, he will start listening to Sean Hannity, not Tucker Carlson when it comes to Iran because the only thing he fears worse than another war is looking weak. Uh, and you can see his discomfort with the Syria issue because it's really hard for him to spin that narrative to look strong. And if the Iranians draw blood or capture Americans or do something else in one of this tit for tat spiral, it'll be very difficult for Trump not to pull the trigger. Remember, he only didn't attack Iran after the drone was shot down because they only shot down a robot. Had they shot down an American aircraft, with a couple of pilots, or a spy aircraft, which would have had more than that, um, my, my, I suspect the, uh, he would have struck uh, Iran that time, and we would have been off to the races. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so we were talking about using Iraq as a sort of center point in the Middle East policy. <clears throat> but talking about this, you are missing an important country in the Middle East, which is Egypt. Uh, the entire history of inter-Arab relations of the last 70 years is the balancing between Iraq and Egypt for influence over the whole Middle East. So this point was completely missing in the discussion. You are too high from Iraq versus Iran and forget about the rest of the Middle East, it seems to me. 
Secondly, uh, we are not talking about the general decline of the importance of the Middle East in American considerations because of the reduced importance of oil in the Middle East. We don't need to guarantee oil in Saudi Arabia anymore the way President Roosevelt did in 1945 because now we have enough oil in the United States to even export oil. So the issue of oil supplies is not important to the United States anymore. The issue of oil prices is still important, but supplies are not an issue. They can be balanced by OPEC and by anybody else. So there's a general decline in the importance of the Middle East in the considerations of the administration, and that is sort of a background to everything that you are talking, which you may want to look at. That is uh, something that's more closer to my heart, and that's to do with uh, the contradictions in American non-proliferation policy in the Middle East. Uh, on the one hand, you talk about the maximum pressure in Iraq, which I sort of agree with what you're talking about. But on the other hand, uh, this administration policy is completely laissez fair when it comes to nuclear energy with non-proliferation connotations in Saudi Arabia and in Turkey. And even in Iraq, you start hearing some cautious talk about Maybe we should start thinking about reviving our nuclear policy. So there are lots of inconsistencies here, which you might comment. Thank you. So a couple of things, and because there's there's a lot there, and uh, just touch on briefly. Uh, no offense to Egypt, but I think it's been geopolitically marginalized in all sorts of uh, ways uh, since uh, the revolution. Uh, I think large they they find themselves in a, in, a, in a sense where. Um, they, ha they, they, they now are, in some, in some ways, a subordinate that is, uh, their patrons are the Gulf states that helped reverse the Muslim Brotherhood's ascendance uh, uh, to power and put Sisi uh, in power. And as Egypt's economic troubles uh, uh, continue, and there's every reason to expect that they will, I don't think that that power dynamic is going to change uh, very much. So I think even vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt has been diminished. Uh, and they're just not at the focal point of of the most important issues going on in the Middle East that used to be the biggest thing we were concerned about was either an Arab-Israeli war or the Israeli-Palestinian issue of which e countries like Egypt were at the center of that. Now, when you have Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, UAE kind of all on the same strategic side against a set of enemies that include Iran, but also the Muslim Brotherhood and Qatar and Turkey and a bunch of other things, I think the center of gravity for the region has shifted to the east uh, and that the Gulf matters, uh, the Gulf and parts of the Levant that don't include Egypt matter more uh, than, uh, than Egypt. My view, others might have a different uh, view. Oil, I think you are right, but I wouldn't over dial it. So the United States is now the world's largest oil producer and we export oil, but what you pay at the pump is set by a global price. And so the good news is like turmoil in places like Libya or Iraq or pushing Iran's oil off the market hasn't driven the price at the pump you know, through the roof to the point that it's caused a recession in the United States. However, if the Abcake attack on Saudi Arabia had not been able to be restored in a number of, of days, if that was a, per if you permanently took off 5 million barrels a day from Saudi Arabia, and the Iranians basically demonstrated that they could do it, they just chose not to do it uh, uh, in, this, in this particular case, then oil was suddenly going to matter uh, for U.S. Pol policy uh, uh, in, the, in the Middle East. So there are certain things, the threshold of which has just gone higher. And by the way, one of the things that could cause the price of oil to skyrocket in a way that would devastate the American economy is an all-out war with Iran, which would devastate, which Iran would retaliate with by mining the Strait of Hormuz and devastating uh, Saudi Arabia's oil infrastructure. And then we might be back in the world of 100 or 120 or higher and higher oil prices. And then... Um, you know, God help us if that if that happens. I do think though that there are three kind of structural shifts that you're absolutely uh, that uh, some of which you touched on, that are reasons why objectively the United States is going to shift more and more towards an offshore posture vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. The three I would point to: one is changing energy markets, which uh, reduces or increases the threshold of conflict required to devastate the U.S. economy in the Middle East. Two is the resurgence of great power politics, which means that, yes, we care about Russia and China, but the place to compete with them is not in the Middle East. The place that we need to focus on are the Indo-Pacific uh, and Europe. And then third is just the political exhaustion of the American public with the Middle East uh, be, uh, because of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and that's something that Obama tapped into and it's something that Trump uh, tapped into. And there's no candidate to replace Trump who's arguing to go all the way back in uh, in the Middle East. So between oil, geopolitics, and domestic politics in the United States, we ain't going back uh, uh, to uh, the levels that you saw
before. The last point I will make on nuclear is that, that the challenge is that there are kind of two camps in the Trump administration. There, is the, there are the anti-Iran hawks who are very much non-proliferation maximalists. And then there are the transactional business corporate folks who want to cut deals for Westinghouse and others to sell American nuclear power technology to anybody who wants to buy it. Uh, and that, those, that tension, like so many other tensions in the Trump administration, has never been resolved. Uh, and that there were like, dreams by people like Mike Flynn and others at the very beginning, remember when he was National Security Advisor for 24 days, uh, at the very beginning, to basically use nuclear power sales throughout the Middle East in conjunction with lifting sanctions on Russia to forge a grand bargain that would align the United States, Russia, and the Gulf states against Iran, right? So they've also thought about nuclear energy and selling nuclear energy to Saudi Arabia and others as a, as a grand strategic play at times. Um, but in any case, I think mostly, like many other things in the Trump administration, it's not really by design. It's by the fact that you have one part of the policy apparatus that's pushing on Iran and the nuclear file and the other that's pushing to make money uh, for American corporations. Just real quick on uh, Egypt's a good uh, point because a trend line in the region, which also comes into Iraq, so I should have mentioned it before, but this rivalry between Qatar and Turkey and Saudi, UAE, and Egypt. Um, is driving an awful lot of the thinking in the region right now. It plays into Iraq. I saw it in the government formation period last summer, where certain parties, particularly on the Sunni side, some were supported by Qatar, some are supported by Saudi Arabia. Um, very dangerous dynamic. Um, and the Qatar guys were a little closer to the Iranians in forming the government. It was just, you know, <coughs> everything much more complicated. That, um, that division, and that's a geostrategic competition. It has to do with political Islam. It has to do with personal hatred of each other and the leaders, Erdogan and MBS and everything else, um, is, can play out in Iraq in a very negative way. I think we've got to watch that. Second, on um, I totally agree, the less dependency on the Middle East oil and everything. Um, but we've been trying to pivot to Asia like for over 10 years. Um, and we are one, it's, we always wanted to, I mean, I've read the national security strategy on great power competition. I think it's a good document, but we're always one attack away uh, from all that being washed away. And the major Al Qaeda type threats um, are all in Syria right now. And if we, if an airplane is taken out of the sky or something else, um, we will be right back because the American people will demand it. And I think those risks are quite high. So uh, we got to be pretty smart about how we uh, wind down in the Middle East um, and a little smarter than we were when we got in. So we have a question over here and then one in the back and I'm gonna ask you guys to please try to limit yourself to one question each. Okay, uh, my question is to do, maybe I misunderstood uh, uh, the person, but you know, I listening to you, I'm thinking that the two notions that I was always critical of is you know, of Bush and uh, Iraq, but maybe he had a point, if I understood correctly, in promoting democracy because democracy in the previous panel here is the person you know democracy actually to quote it actually works it fell in some form it works so maybe in, uh, our you know dumping on Bush for that is not that. Uh, and the, the one, and, and when you stress with Trump the question of process and whatever, the one instance that I have heard people say that actually Trump was right and nobody gives him credit for it, not that I, you know, Trump, I, anything positive and I am <laughs> terrible. But, but the point is that with North Korea and the type of leader that is there, there is no process, there's nobody else, uh, you know, weighing in. It's him and him alone, and it is maybe the distraction that he had that didn't de actually lead to a even better deal that was a, a, the, the one instance when he was right, not, be, not because he's smarter, but because of the constellation of, of how that leader works. So, <clears throat> okay, great. Well, maybe I can do the first, and maybe if you want to take <laughs> Trump. Yeah. I just I, look. I, I'll put my cards on the table. Um, I support. I I think it's in the U.S. interest now 
to not let Iraqi democracy collapse. I don't think there's any rational cost-benefit ratio in which the way in which we implanted or tried to implant democracy in Iraq was worth the cost. Uh, you know, 4,000, uh, 4,500 American dead, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis dead, millions of people displaced and their lives uh, ruined, $2 trillion, a huge strategic gift to Iran, uh, and a huge strategic distraction from the rest of the world. So my point would be, I don't, I think that, that while part of the diagnosis may have been that, that correct, that autocracy in the Middle East was, a, was part of the challenge of both violent extremism, like groups like Al-Qaeda, and anti-Americanism, that the notion that you solve that problem by invading a country in violation of international law and setting in motion a bunch of effects that were predicted at the time. So as much as I, is, even if one wants to give uh, the Bush administration some credit for, some more credit than sometimes they are given, they deserve no credit for ignoring uh, a bunch of warnings uh, about what was going to happen that have now happened. Uh, much like whatever happens with, with Iran every, and the Trump administration, everything that is happening was not only predictable, it was predicted. Uh, uh, you know, myself and a ton of other people who wrote in this space all said exactly what was going to happen when Trump pulled out of the uh, of the Iran deal, and it's exactly what's happened. So anyway, that's a that's a long way of, of answering I think a good question, which is we can one can be supportive of Iraqi democracy today without having to retrospectively believe that it was all worth it uh, at the at the outset. But, Thank you. You want to add anything? Do should we collect more questions? Yeah, North, I'm going to. North Korea. Pass on North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have some student questions. Sorry, yeah. I'm Neil, I'm not um, Where your portrayal of how the, the flashpoints are there and how likely a crisis is in the next, next few months, a few years, at least we remember from like, like, how high that risk is. At the same time, this entire discussion has been about how very hard in this particular region crafting strategies, aligning in those means. Um, but I, I would, I'm curious for the both of you if you could reflect on uh, the domestic and bureaucratic constraints that the U.S. now has to crafting good strategies in, uh, in response to those flashpoints that you know are, are going to happen. So, you know, O'Brien is cutting the NSC staff in half, you know, as, as we speak, domestic polarization, there's some... Uh, perhaps some rogue cabinet members uh, inside the White House, if you will. So speak to the domestic and bureaucratic constraints for the strategic response. Let's say one domestic constraint to strategy over, since 9-11 um, is the pendulum swings between administrations. So you always have a pendulum swing, but we have like the pendulum goes through the clock and then it goes through the other side of the clock. And this makes our ability to exert influence and leadership around the world um, much harder because people are like, what, okay, if I sign up with you for this now, what's going to happen two years from now? There's no kind of just medium of kind of basic principles that we can all agree on um, because of the nature of the differences between administrations. Um, Trump wants to undo everything Obama did. And um, I think on the, what we're seeing in Syria, because I'm seeing him and some of his officials talk about it as if this was all Obama's policy and so our getting out of Syria is a good thing. Well, he took total ownership of the counter-ISIS campaign and did some things in particular to uh, make some decisions to make it his own, and he brags about it. Um, when the Obama team came in and Colin's team came in, there was a reaction to everything Bush had done. Whereas, in fact, and Colin was a very wise voice in these days, you know, the, the last few years of the Bush administration were very different than the first few years. So. Um, but this pendulum swing has made it very difficult for us to be a reliable leader in the world. And we are a global power. And so I think that has been uh, damaging. In terms of like internal interagency, there's no like interagency uh, chart, which is going to make all this better. Um, but, you know, Eisenhower said something like um, process doesn't guarantee uh, good policy, but lack of process pretty much guarantees <laughs> bad policy and can easily precipitate a disaster. And right now we have no process. Um, and um, that is exacerbating. 
So I agree 100%. The only thing I would add is, so the first thing you have to do is you do have to have a strategic matching, as, as Brett said, with a set of achievable objectives and means you're actually willing to produce. And the mix match between maximalist objectives and minimalist uh, uh, means is a huge problem in the current administration. There were times where it was a problem in the administration that, that, that I served uh, in. So getting that strategic mismatch uh, uh, corrected. But otherwise, I, th I, would, I think the three problems are the three Ps, people, process, and partisanship. And process and partisanship, uh, uh, Brett already alluded to. But the other thing is like you need people. And I think one of the things that we've seen in the Ukraine scandal in the last couple of weeks is actually how amazing some of our people in government are who are professionals, right? People like uh, Masha Yovanovitch, our ambassador in Ukraine. Uh, how amazingly well-written the whistleblower report is, not because it was written by committee, but because CIA, CIA analysts write things like that. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and also how Fiona Hill uh, uh, served uh, as senior director uh, for Russia and the Trump administration, one of the hardest jobs probably in government. Um, but in many respects, uh, those people are becoming increasingly scarce uh, because many of our best professionals in government have been demoralized and chased away. Some of them have been uh, uh, thrown out. Uh, others have said, I'm not going out like this because of how much they've uh, been uh, denigrated. Uh, and I think one concern that, that the next president will have whether he or she is a Republican or a Democrat, is that they'll get in the car, they'll put the car in the ignition, they'll turn the key and realize there's no engine. Because you can't actually do these things without people. And like, if your Ukraine policy is run by a personal lawyer and a hotel guy from the Pacific Northwest who's a big donor, that's different than if you're running it with your ambassador and your assistant secretary of state and other things. Like, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. I mean, Masha Yovanovitch served presidents of both parties, right? Bill Burns, who is like the least hyperbolic person in all of Washington. If you haven't read it, read this foreign affairs piece that he put out, I think, a day and a half ago. This guy has served five presidents and 10 secretaries of state for both parties. He is no partisan. And he said, and he said that in his decades of looking at the State Department, it has never been worse than right now. And so if one thinks that whenever we come out of this current moment, we're going to have to dig ourselves out of a hole quickly, the first thing you're going to have to do is get the people to do it. And um, it sounds kind of boring, and, 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 but like getting the authorities from Congress to hire a bunch of people and bringing career ambassadors back and having things like a GI Bill for new diplomats and public, ser you know, public service that goes beyond the military and all sorts of things. Like we have to think about that now or we're, never, or we're not going to fix this problem. Uh, and therefore, all this other stuff, we can have great conversations like this if none of it will matter. Great. I just said two seconds. That's a great point. This Iraq conflict, and we fought these wars with 1% of our population, less than 1% of our population. I mean, Neil, who just asked the question, served multiple tours in Iraq. Um, well, we were winning when he left, <laughs> whenever that was. <laughs> if we want to do these things in the world, and we want to take on China, and we want to do all this stuff, we really need to think through recruiting people in the government service, retention, um, and administration, uh, we're doing the opposite. And people are leaving in droves, and um, the professionalism is really starting to erode. Well, we're training students. Right. We've got great pre-docs and post-docs, so we have a question from one. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, a lot of my dissertation research looks at alliances between governments and foreign militants. Um, and so I was curious if you, if both of you could speak a little bit about um, the withdrawal, uh, the recent withdrawal of US troops and how that there's been a lot of language discussing how that's abandoning the SDF, abandoning the Kurds, almost language as if you know we're abandoning a state ally. Um, and so I would be curious if you could speak a little bit about whether or not you think abandoning a militant group would send signals to other state allies, other coalition partners that may let make them more or less likely to cooperate with the United States in terms of security or in other realms in the future. It's a great question. Um, this was not something that just the U.S. did unilaterally, so we have a big coalition. All of our decisions were made in consultation. Um, it's a coalition of 80 countries, the military contributors, about 22 countries. Um, very broad support given all the alternatives, and we had many coalition meetings about this for the policy in Syria to support what became the SDF. So um, in that sense, this was a very much alliance consensus policy. Um, and to completely abandon it on, on 
directly on one phone call without any consultation with other allies, um, I think it will actually it'll make it more difficult. And you're looking at the person with General Allen and others who used to go capital to capital and say, we're going to do this. Here's what we need from you. you know, we need your special forces here. We need your you know, Spain. We want them to take over a big facility in Iraq to train uh, artillery units and things. I think these are hard things. And it's a political uh, risk for some of these countries to move them. But they did it. And so while we're supporting a non-state actor <coughs> in Syria, it was part of a consensus-driven approach within a coalition of many countries. Um, you know, I hear from my former counterparts in these coalition capitals who are like <laughs> dumbfounded. And in fact, some of these countries have their people in Syria when suddenly it's announced with no consultation that we're leaving Syria. And um, it is not a surprise to me that this unraveled so fast. And that's why um, on Sunday night when I saw that statement from the, from the State Department, I came out very hard and very publicly that this is a disaster. Um, because there was some hope that we kind of limit it, church will come in a little bit, no. Um, the tapestry of Northeast Syria was pretty stable. Um, the minute you say something like what President Trump said on Sunday night, um, it can unravel really fast. And I'm not surprised at all that it did. And we are now emergency, we are doing an emergency evacuation of all of our personnel. So this will have huge ramifications with, co with allies that you're trying to sign up to do hard things. Uh, no question. Um, at the end of the day, do, when we need a non-state actor to do something with all of our various tools, if they're under threat, will they work with us for their own reasons? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't say no, but I think the questions that will be asked of, of the United States will be, um, uh, we'll get much more difficult questions. Um, anyway, I'm just trying to, I don't want to overstate the consequences of this, but I just, I can't understate. It's huge. And having just come from UAE with a split screen, people are watching on TV as we were evacuating uh, what was a pretty successful mission and the Russians are taking over our bases because we left in such, literally they're taking over bases like our food is still on the table because we are just uh, in total evacuation. Um, while Putin is doing a state visit in the city I was in the next day. So that's split screen. That's why it is a searing people's memories on this. Um, it is something that will be very difficult to recover from. And um, so, yeah, I think the consequences are quite profound. So a couple of things, just, just in general, I, th I think that there's actually a bipartisan consensus that largely in reaction to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that to prosecute these conflicts going forward, we need to rely on an indirect approach. And that was Obama's approach and it was Trump's approach. That is that you largely work by, with, and through local actors where it's not hundreds of thousands of Americans on the ground. It's small numbers, a lot of sp mostly special operations forces, uh, uh, not just ours, but also with countries like the Brits and the, and, and the French. Uh, and the Australians uh, and others, and sometimes regional actors like the UAE uh, and, and others, backed up by drones and air power and everything else, and that that is a more sustainable model uh, uh, for the United States. Whether it's, the, whether it's the, a good model or ethically right or other things, we, we actually should have conversations about that, uh, given the destruction of the counter-ISIS campaign uh, in places like Iraq and Syria. But there's no question that militarily, economically, and politically, it's more sustainable for us, right? So that relies on local actors. Right? And so the, in the first instance, you know, the social science question is when we abandon one set of local actors, does it bleed over to our credibility in transactions with other local actors? In some ways it might not because we and the local actors may have common interests and so they have an interest in aligning with us because we will enable them to achieve some objective, whether or not we abandon them down the road. But in other areas, we're asking them to take risks and to make our priorities their priorities. And we did that with the Kurds in a lot of instances. Um, and they may have other options right, uh, to go to other patrons who have different priorities or to sit on the sidelines in a way that don't represent our interests. And so I think we have to consider that possibility uh, as well. Um, the, the last point I will make is this is actually another place where, where credibility and process are linked. Um, look, I think, you know, Trump said he, we were getting out of Syria eight months ago. And then essentially there was no process to actually make that happen. Instead, what happened was we pulled half our troops out and then the Pentagon folks literally just hoped the president forgot. <laughs> that we had troops in Iraq, in, in Syria. And then Erdogan reminded him and said, oh, by the way, they're on the front line and I'm coming through. And Trump, you know, chickened out, right? And pulled our troops uh, off, the, off the front line where they were kind of serving as a peacekeeper slash tripwire uh, for just such, an, uh, just such an incursion. It's not just the fact that we are retreating or withdrawing. It's the shambolic nature of it. 
it's the chaos. It's the fact that, that, that Russian mercenaries are showing up within hours of American forces leaving, trolling us by taking selfies in American bases. It's the fact that we are now bombing some of those bases, according, apparently, because we weren't able to take all the qu equipment with us. Uh, it's the way in which our forces who have fought so bravely got bracketed by artillery from a NATO ally and retreated under fire. Like, we don't do that. But we just did it, right? So I think it's, it's, it's not just the fact of abandonment. It's the process whereby we did it that adds insult to injury. And I think it's an open question from a social science perspective about whether that kind of dials the credibility consequences up if it's done in this way, right? Kind of like the person hanging, hanging off the helicopter in Saigon or something. But I think, it's, I think I, the impression is that it's worse uh, because not just that it happened, but the way that it happened. Okay, Cole, you get the last question. Okay, good. Uh, following up on the uh, previous uh, question, irrespective of the, uh, the betrayal and the chaos, one of the arguments that I've seen, particularly on the right, uh, in support of the recent withdrawal from Syria is that by allying with the YPG, effectively the Syrian wing of the PKK, we were building a Turkish, I mean, a, a Kurdish uh, terrorist proto state on uh, the southern border of Turkey. And this is why some 80% of Turks are see this latest incursion by Erdogan. Even his opponents they see it favorably. Um, and given that our relationship ultimately with Turkey as a NATO partner is much greater than our, or more important than our relationship with the YPG, um, is there uh, is, is there no merit to to this to this argument that there is a, a good strategic reason for ultimately um, kind of trying to repair our relationship with Turkey? Uh, in this way, and is there any scenario in which the Turks can finally play the, the kind of anti-ISIS role that we've been asking them to play for a long time? Uh, yeah, let me take this off. So first of all, their policy choices. If you want to leave a caliphate, that was we could have left the caliphate, particularly in Syria, because we had like nobody to work with, and um, the YPG was not our first choice. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars, and I cannot overstate the amount of attention and effort we put into building a force under what is called the Free Syrian Army. There is no Free Syrian Army, but that's what we kind of did. We, and we, um, I went to Ghazi and Tep a number of times, and I saw the whole thing. And um, there just was no other option. We delayed the counter-ISIS campaign probably overall a year because we tried to build alternative options. There's a town called Manvij in Syria, uh, which is now under control of the Russians, but um, it is where there were about 3,000 foreign terrorist fighters in there. It is where the Paris attacks were planned and launched from. Uh, we and we knew that stuff was all being done. We delayed the operation in Manbij for about six months because we were trying to work with an alternative that Turkey supported, um, and it simply didn't work. Um, so this kind of goes on and on. Um, all these terrorist foreign fighter guys were coming through Turkey. We said to Turkey, hey, man, you got to shut your border right here in this area. And they wouldn't, they never did it. So this was like a very painful experience. Anyone that worked on it came to the realization that Turkey on this issue is not a partner, plus all the other problems with Turkey. Um, that said, with the YPG, um, we got assurances from them uh, early on, and these are guys are Syrian, um, no cross-border attacks ever into Turkey. Um, we can't give you that much equipment at all, um, and we didn't. And for four years, we haven't seen them ever cross the border into Turkey. In fact, when these towns um, were under control of ISIS, the border was wide open to Turkey. And when the SDF took them, Turkey built a wall. So there was no immediate threat uh, to Turkey. This is a lot of this is, is Erdogan's um, domestic politics. Um, there was another, I think, mistake made after when Trump said get out in December, because it's very clear that Trump wants out. And um, the ultimate end state, and I wrote about this in Foreign Affairs, and it's messy, but was a, a deal between Damascus and the SDF. Nobody likes that, but that was kind of like, if we're not going to do a northern Iraq since 1991 and stay there, um, that is kind of the end state. And Turkey would accept that, actually, from what we were hearing. And that deal was kind of emerging um, last fall. And I think through some creative diplomacy, we had leverage to shape that in a manageable way. Um, but that, when the policy then changed, this gets to ends, ways, and means. No, we. And we told the SDF, particularly after December, even after Trump said, get out, uh, do not talk to Damascus, cut, you know, don't do that because we're going to be here indefinitely, albeit in smaller numbers. 
um, or staying until Iran is out of Syria, or staying until the Geneva process ends. Um, I think those were huge mistakes. And Turkey started to then say, wait a minute, you're going to be here forever? So um, there was tension in this relationship from the beginning, but I think from the Turkey side, it's been totally overstated. I'll finally say this. When we started working with Turkey in Kobani, um, we supplied the Kobani battle through Turkey. I spent a lot of time in Ankara with Erdogan and Davutoglu organizing that whole thing. Um, Turkey at the time was talking to the YPG. This is the head of the PYD, which is the political arm of the YPG, was in Ankara all the time. What really changed here was Turkey had an election in 2015, summer of 2015. The Kurdish party known as the HDP did way better than Erdogan anticipated. Erdogan canceled the election. He de redeclared a war on the PKK, and suddenly the YPG became world's number one terrorist to Turkey. That's what made this much more complicated. So we're, our eyes are wide open on this whole thing, understand it left and right, but it has more to do with internal Turkish <coughs> politics than a threat from the YPG into Turkey. The, the, the last thing I'll just, to, one is to, is to reinforce this point, which is that, um, and I wrote a long article in, in Foreign Policy Magazine on this in, in, in uh, spring of 2017, if you're interested in the details, but I, I, essentially we gave Turkey multiple opportunities to come up with an alternative, right? Uh, when ISIS emerged, you had a huge jihadist force on their border. One would have assumed that Turkey would have cared about that. They weren't actually particularly concerned about that in 2014 because Erdogan was a kind of hear no evil, see no evil, as long as they don't attack me, it's not a problem, and I'm focused on Assad. So when Brad and General Allen and, and myself, and most importantly the vice president, go to Erdogan in the late fall of 2014 and say, look, we, we would like you to open up your bases uh, in Turkey for the counter-ISIS campaign, and in conjunction, we'll essentially create a kind of buffer zone right, where uh, we'll use uh, vetted uh, Arab forces to clear out ISIS, and some of our special operations forces can operate, and some of yours, and we'll provide air cover, and we can clear ISIS off your border. And that got all the way past the prime minister, who at the time was Davutoglu, and it hit a wall with Erdogan, who met with the vice president for hours, and Erdogan said, yeah, yeah, that's fine, I'll do that if you go to war with Assad because he called for a no-fly zone over all of northern Syria, which the Pentagon said would have required us to take out uh, Assad's integrated air defense network and go to, and do what we did in Syria, what we did in Libya. And Obama wasn't going to do that. Uh, and so at that time, Erdogan's priority was not ISIS. It was, it was Assad. And he tried to leverage our concern for ISIS to get us to go to war with Assad. And we weren't going to do that. Uh, so we turned more to the Kurds. Uh, then, in the, then as the Kurds clear more of the border in the spring of 2015, Turkey suddenly now cares very much about their border because they see uh, uh, the YPG and associated Arab militia that would come to be known as the Syrian Democratic Forces now controlling a big chunk of their border. And they again come to us and they say, stop, 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 stop. Now we're willing to do more. And they could never produce Arab forces who could pass our vetting. Why? Because they were working with forces that weren't Al-Qaeda, but, were but were the Taliban. Okay, groups like Arar al-Sham and other uh, hardline Islamists and extremist groups who could never pass our vetting and who didn't have the capabilities to actually do this. So, so when Brett says we slowed this down by a year, it's because it was like Groundhog Day. Like every six months, the, the Turks would throw a flag and we would rush off to Ankara or Istanbul, depending on where the meetings were, and we would try to get them to provide an alternative to the YPG, and they never could. So if there's anybody to blame for us getting in bed with the YPG, it's Erdogan. Because Erdogan had every opportunity to do something else to control the threat on his border and decided not to do it. That's thing one. And the last thing I will point out is, it's not just that prior to this, Turkey was willing to talk to the YPG until Erdogan's domestic politics flipped. It's that our relationship with the YPG would have actually made us a useful partner in having a conversation to de-escalate the conflict between Turkey and the PKK. Yes, the PKK are a designated terrorist organization. Yes, there are lines of, of uh, relationship between the YPG and the PKK. But the PKK is also an insurgency that's raged in Turkey for decades. Uh, and there's probably not a military solution to it. And at one point, the Turks, the Turkish government appeared to recognize that. And we could have used the YPG as a point of entry into having a conversation to de-escalate the conflict diplomatically between Turkey and the PKK. But that's not what Erdogan's interested in. So do I wish we would have been able to find different partners? Yeah. Do I wish the Turks had been more helpful in finding us and helping us find different partners? Yep. Uh, is there is there a bunch, you know, enough blame to go around? Yeah, but this kind of 
post hoc rationalization by people on the right that like the Kurds were all, always evil and we were always going to abandon them. The last point I would make about this is that you know Trump campaigned during the campaign of having a secret plan to defeat ISIS and he wasn't going to tell anybody about it because he didn't want to show his hand. And it showed it, it. It it ended up that his secret plan to defeat ISIS was to do exactly what Barack Obama had been doing before, uh, and and he and then he fiddled with it at the edges at the behest of people like Brett and General Ma and Secretary Mattis and others, and it was effective in defeating the caliphate. But it created a set of dilemmas for us in northern Syria that were always going to be there and could only be managed if you had the people, the process. Uh, 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 and uh, and you were able to kind of get on the same strategic page, and that's something that this administration, whatever else one thinks about it, has never been able to do. Let me just say one, I know we're getting off track in Iraq, but Cole, it's a good <laughs> question, and I, I know you're, you're in this debate, so um, the facts here are really important. Um, the Trump administration came in, and um, Obama had a, we had a meeting with Obama three days before the inauguration, because mm -hmm. Pompeo said yesterday, and I work with Pompeo, but he's when we came in, ISIS was running all over the place, total mess, people in cages, there was no plan. Okay, that's just not true. When they came in, and I did the transition, we were about 30 kilometers from Raqqa. We had stopped because we had to make a decision of how to do Raqqa. We were about two-thirds of the way through Mosul. Um, we met with Obama three days before the inauguration, and my recommendation was that to do Raqqa, we had to arm the YPG. We'd actually never done that before. Um, and I recommended to Obama, I think, make this decision, pass this hot potato to a new team. It's going to delay the whole thing. If we delay the Raqqa battle, it's going to be even more bloody and messier, and major threats at the time are kind of coming out of Raqqa. The Trump administration and Mike Flynn and these guys, which is interesting, asked us to not make that decision because they wanted to look at it, which was very fair. It's a complicated question. When they came in, we worked with, and I met with Flynn and everybody, and we did a massive strategic review. And we did two options for the president, and we sent our best military planners to Turkey, and they sat in Turkey for almost four months, and we presented two options to the president, Mr. President. And we had a meeting with the president, Trump. There are two options. Uh, first, we can just leave ISIS in Raqqa and let the Russians do it. That's option. So there are three options. That's option one. Second, uh, we can arm the YPG, which President Obama had not done. Here's what we'd have to give them. It's really not that much. Uh, it would require very few additional U.S. troops. Um, and the third option, which we've developed with Turkey, which Erdogan likes, um, would require 15 to 20,000 American troops because the Turkish army is not the NATO army that we used to know. Post-coup, it's a very different military force. And the opposition is a mess. So there was an option that Erdogan liked, but it would require massive skin in the game from us. 15 to 20,000 troops, our best military planners put that together. Trump, it took two seconds. He said, arm the Kurds and take Raqqa. He made that decision. So. This kind of post hoc stuff, which I'm seeing, uh, is crazy. Um, in any event, this is off topic, but I know this is like the issue of the moment. We're also uh, off schedule. Yes, all right. um, but Beyond I, trans, we're post schedule. How, how fortunate are we to have Brett and Colin as part of the Stanford community?